Oh. Uh-huh. 
Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we're thankful, Father, for this opportunity to be here this morning. We're thankful, Father, for this opportunity to go to you in prayer, Father. It is such a blessing that we can go to you at any time, Father, that you hear, hear us and that you answer our prayers. Father, we thank you for not just the physical blessings that we enjoy each day. And, and Father, we can see your, the creation around us and the beauty and the beautiful design, Father, that you had for us. As we look about, we see rainbows and we see the sun and we see the stars, we see the moon. And Father, it's just endless of all your majestic work. We, Father, we are thankful for the spiritual blessings that are in Christ to enjoy to, and that are there for us, Father. We thank you for your love and dying on the cross, Father. We thank you, Father, for your written word that God helps guide our lives. It's just like a road map, Father, that we can follow at any time if we look into it and see the wonderful words and the wonderful instruction for us and the examples there, Father. It is our prayer, Father, that we would study that more. And as, as a result of that, Father, that we would be better stewards, that we'd be better servants. And, Father, that our manner of life will reflect that we are committed to you. We're thankful for this congregation and each one that comes here, Father, for their desire to learn more, to be more like you. And Father, we know that we go through difficult times and challenging times and and Father, we are thankful, Father, again, that we can go to you. We ask for our, the leaders for our country, Father, that in decisions that are made, Father, that might be in harmony with your word and your teachings. We pray for them, Father, in their leadership roles that that will happen. We're thankful for our missionaries and all the work that goes on in, in different parts of the world, Father, for their wonderful examples of faith and commitment to teach others. We ask now, Father, as we continue through this worship, that you'll be pleased with our thoughts and our words of, of singing and praise to you. And, Father, that you will see in us a desire to grow stronger, to be more spiritual. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper as we sing this song. I gave my life for thee.
26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, and he broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We're remembering the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. But we're remembering the covenant. Throughout the Bible, Old Testament and into the New Testament, there's different covenants. This covenant of the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross is for the remission of sins. And at the end of this verse, that we can be in heaven for him. Remember the covenant take this morning. It's not just a one-way street either. Covenants are agreements. Covenants are binding. Covenants require obligation from more than one party. We have the bread. Remember Christ's body. That he lived on the earth to bring us that sacrifice and to make that covenant. Let's bow. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for making a way for us to be with you. We thank you for Jesus Christ, for his life on this earth. For his word that has been brought to us by you and many dedicated Christians throughout the years. Lord, right now, we remember his body that lived and died to sacrifice and rose anew to be with you. We thank you for that we partake this morning. In Jesus' name. Thank you. 
invitation song, so if you'd like to mark that. Your only son no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty sod and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they extent 
that uh, all you can do now is demolish a place. He goes on to say, not only did that happen, but the city fined him. And he had to pay all this big money for this scoundrel who was renting this place, who didn't pay the rent, and demolished the place. Well, well, what do you think you would have done if you happened to be the landlord? Now I'm asking for a, a Christian response. <laughs> The other fellow says this. This is a different part of the article. He said, when, I, when they finally evicted the guy, and I don't know how they do that, but here's what he said. There were dead guinea pigs, three abandoned dogs, one abandoned cat, mountains of rubbish, dirty clothes, drug paraphernalia, dog and cat fetus throughout the house. And he said, the house that I rented to them was less than a year old. Not only did they do that, but the tenant had a uh, one of those mountain motorcycles. And he said this, he left oil and mud and tire tracks, not only on the floor, but on marks on the wall. Well, you think that's something. Last one. This happened out in Illinois. The interesting thing here is the person who did this was the daughter of the mayor in that particular city. I don't know what the dispute was because the article did not say but what this person did, she hired a guy by the name of Rios. And when the landlord came to the house, he beat him up with a baseball bat. 25 years in prison. And the daughter of the mayor was up for seven years in prison. Now Jesus tells the story of some deadbeat renters who were not living in New York or L.A., but it takes us back to the ancient land of Israel, and I'm reading to you, as you already have it marked, Luke chapter 20, and beginning in verse, verse number 9. Then he began to tell a story. By the way, this is the final week in the ministry of Jesus. He has come in on his messianic terms. Everything has been foreordained. Nothing is happening, happens yet. He's already cleansed the temple, but here's how it goes. And it's interesting to me, I'll just mention this uh, real quickly, is I found it rather interesting in the final days of the Lord, before they crucified him, he tells a parable, a story. And he begins to say this, a certain man planted a vineyard and the vine dressers and went to a far country. Now at vintage time, harvest time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the rent which would have been in the produce, and, but the vine dressers, they beat him and they sent him away empty handed. Now, this story, by the way, doesn't make a whole lot of sense just from a secular point of view, because at that point, what would you have done? You sent the father to pick up the rent, and those, in those days, it was produce, agriculture society. And they beat the guy up. Then the Bible goes on to say, now at vintage time, verse number 10, he sent a servant to the vine dresser that him some of the fruit of the vineyard, but the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. And again he sent another servant, and they beat him also. Not only did that, they treat him shamefully and sent him away empty handed. Well, here you go again. And again, in verse number 12, 
he sent a third and they wounded him and they cast him out. Now at this point, I just have to tell you, I've had it up to here. How about you? Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him. I've been reading this all week and I already know they're not going to do that. Then the verse says, but when the vine dresser saw him, this is the heir, come and let us kill him that we might gain the inheritance. So presumably the father or the owner of the uh, vineyard has died. Here comes the only heir. If we kill him, we can steal the land. So say the scholars. So they cast him out of the vineyard, verse number 15, and they kill him. Therefore, what shall the owner of the vineyard do? I know what I'd do. I know what you would do. And of course, he asked the question to the audience. And in each one, they said, God forbid or may it not happen. But he'll ask, what do you think these guys ought to get? And they will say, do you ought to punish those miserable scoundrels? And they were absolutely right. Now, uh, I thought I'm going to try to be brief today, believe it or not. And uh, I'm, I'm, the, the thing that was coming across my mind as I was reading this particular uh, uh, story is the response of the landowner because it's not in some ways it just doesn't seem like this ought to be the response and that's not the response even the uh, people who are working in the vineyard think they think what the landowner ought to do is come in and just destroy these people and that's what ultimately happened but watch what happens here here's what I want us to think about that's so unusual. Number one is this extraordinary, incredible patience of the landowner. Because you see, what we find out is that the servants that he was sending were the Old Testament prophets. And of course, what the Bible speaks about, you know, Jesus will say, what, or, or Stephen will say, what servants or what prophets did you guys not kill or persecute? So everyone that God had sent over and over and over again, they beat up, they persecuted, they threw them in prison, and they mistreated them. So God, there's this, there's this incredible patience that God has with us. Hold on just a moment. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, uh, Peter says that God is not willing that any should perish, but is long-suffering that all men might come to repentance and be saved. Hold on, I want you to think about that. God is extremely, incredibly patient and long-suffering with us. And the reason is he does not want even one person to be lost. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Because, you see, you would think that in the story the boss was going to show them who's the boss and put an end to those guys right away. Now, if I were to ask you, and I think that you would probably say, there are many times in our life that we're awful glad, glad that God has been patient with us. Because there were times in our life that we were out of step. And if God were to act uh, immediately when we're out of step, we'd be in some serious trouble. Amen? But you see, what we've got to understand is God was long-suffering and the idea is that God was enduring. It's not just a matter of time, but he's long-suffering in order that none of us should be lost. God does, hold on a minute. God does not want you to be lost. He is not willing. He does not want you to be lost. And that's why he has been patient. That's why Peter said he's not, you know, he's not tardy, so to speak. Or he does not delay, King James, like men think of delay. But his delay has purpose. 
So God is patient, number one. Now the second thing that I want you to think about is this. The reason that God does not act is because of his love for mankind. Now, in Acts chapter 2, I want you to see this. There's an extraordinary passage in Acts chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse number 22, and it says here, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested, that is, by God, to you miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in the midst of you as you saw, you saw that. You yourselves know. Now, here's the verse I want you to think about. Him being delivered by the determinate purpose or counsel and the foreknowledge of God. Well, let's look at that for just a moment. At some point in eternity, there's a counsel. There is a divine committee. Only God has no counselor, so we would understand, would we not? That God is in counsel with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, the counsel has been determined. God has a plan, and there are the Holy Spirit and the Son of God, and God the Father are in the council. In other words, it's a divine committee. Am I still making sense? The agenda is. How are we going to save man? And so what you have there at the council is you got justice, you got grace and mercy being decided. How are you going to get grace and mercy and justice to on how are they going to come together and we can save man? Because you see, on the agenda is that. God is going to have to come up with a plan in order that man might be saved. I hope I'm making sense. Okay. Of course, we don't know what's all discussed there. We know some things. But on somewhere in that meeting, in that council, it had been determined that certain things were going to have to happen. Now, the end of the story, hold on a minute, I don't want you to lose sight of that. God, at time after time after time, had sent his prophets. Every time he sent his prophets, they killed them. They beat them. You would think that would be the end of it, but because of God's great love for mankind, he still wanted to save them. We wouldn't act like that. So when that council was convenient, somewhere, at some point, this had to come on in play. When God said to the son, you're going to have to go down there. And if you go down there, they're going to beat you, they're going to whip you, they're going to spit in your face, they're going to despise you and they're going to reject you. And the son said, prepare for me a body. I'm going to go. I want you to just think on that for just a moment. If though I will go down there, my own will not receive me, they will reject me, they will despise me, but because God loves man so deeply, He's going to go. Now in Acts chapter 2, what happens there is what, what the writer and what Peter wants us to understand that God had decided this and it was going to cost him. And when he goes down there, he's going to die so you could be saved. Now as the, as the act uh, unfolds in verse 37, when they realize, according to the plan, that they had actually killed the Messiah and he had died for our sins, they cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter responded by, listen very carefully, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now, 
It's an odd story. It really is. In real life, it wouldn't happen. And nobody would do what the vine dressed. I know the answer sometimes is on the tenants, how wicked and rebellious, how stubborn, how stiff that they are. But what I wanted to bring across just for a moment this morning, you got to think of the landowner who in the story is God, and God loves you so deeply, and he's been so patient with you. This council was already developing, and then it was fulfilled that Jesus would do for you what nobody else would do. They did. Yeah. All right. I promise to be brave, and I'm going to be. But if you're here today and you haven't given your life to God, I hope that you'll do so as we stand and say. <coughs> Hear the sweet voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, I am the way. Hearken the loving call, obey. Come for me, loves you so. Only a step, only a step. Feel at home 